I'd like to welcome everyone to our February board meeting and make a motion, we'll call this meeting to order, and Mr. Mrs. Tregaskis will the Pledge of Allegiance, and Mr. Larson will lead us in the invocation. Please stand. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our Father in Heaven, we're grateful to be here this evening. We're grateful for the opportunity to serve in the capacity that we do. We are grateful for the children of our district and for their parents. We ask a blessing upon them that the children will be able to do well in their studies, that they will find the motivation to work hard and be able to find success and enjoy success. We ask for a blessing upon the parents as they have work and other challenges in life that they will be able to do the very best for their children and that they might help them in every way to be successful. We're grateful for the administrators and the staff of this district, each and every one, and ask for a blessing upon them in gratitude for their efforts on behalf of our children. We ask you to be with us during this meeting, help us to be able to learn well the issues we need to visit about tonight and that we will make the decisions that will be best for our children and for the other shareholders and stakeholders of our district. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 May I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Okay. We don't call the audience or just public hearing. Okay. So tonight we're going to have a public hearing. So if you are with people that are pro or against, pro for either the four day or the five day, we're going to ask you to come up and have a spokesperson um, and limit you to two minutes for your for your comments. Madam President, if it's okay, if I can, for the members of the public, just kind of outline what's brought us to this point. Is that okay? Sure. Um, in, in November, we started to explore different calendar ideas um, and started getting feedback from different, different stakeholders at that time. Um, November is typically when we would explore school calendars um, and start that process. And that's led us to where we are today. Um, in, these, in January, there were four um, calendar options, two five-day, two four-day that were presented to the board in a work session. And they reviewed those and, and made some minor adjustments to them. And then we um, conducted four um, public meetings, um, one at two and five on each of the last two Thursdays. Um, the board attended those and heard feedback from the public. We've also conducted a survey um, to choose preference, um, to get a, pre it was a preference survey and to collect feedback. Uh, those surveys, there were about 820 responses to the surveys, um, which we, we were very happy about. We've had a number of responses as far as on our, on our Facebook, um, many of which uh, comments, as you can imagine, um, strongly for both. Um, and so this evening, the public hearing will allow the board to hear further consideration, and then they will, they will vote this evening um, for whichever calendar will we will move forward with with the upcoming school year. Um, we want to thank all those who have provided feedback. It's been valuable. Um, it's been a great process. I really appreciate those who have come um, expressing desire for both calendars. It's been very positive. So thank you. Yeah. Kill, Kill Clerk, do you want to come up? Hi, I am Kale Clark, and I am the freshman class president at Sholo High School. I am here speaking on behalf of the students of the, our high school, and I, every single student I have talked to has been pro four day. Um, this four day is the it will be the greatest motivation for our students to do well on tests. Right now, the, we are lacking in that motivation. But if we were able to have this extra day off, it would it would prompt students to study and pay attention in class. Um, 
it will allow it will allow the students who are struggling in class to get the attention they need, and the students who already have learned the standard won't just have to get taken up with busy work. There have been numerous times where I have been on Fridays or days after testing where others have been trying, where the teacher has been trying to reteach those who have not, who did not perform well, while I, as well as several of my peers, sit in the back of the class doing almost nothing. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to share? If you have comments, this is the time to do it. Part of a, uh, just maybe explain, part of a public hearing, which is different than call to the public, is it's a, the ability for the board to interact with you a little bit. So if there are some comments that like to be shared, that would be, uh, that would be great. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Lamista Schultz. I'm a parent at Wippo Ranch Elementary. And I have two younger kids who will be coming up as well. Um, when I first found out about the four-day schedule, I was very concerned for several different reasons. Um, I agree with the young man who just spoke that it sounds like at the high school level, there are issues with Fridays that definitely should be changed. But as a parent of a younger child, I think for consistency, there's a lot of reasons why for those younger kids, that fifth day I think is important. Um, and I don't, I think a lot of the from what I understand, some of the other districts, they do allow the, high, the higher level of courses to have the four days, but the younger kids to go five days, and maybe I'd be more interested in that. But for the younger kids especially, but in some respects for all the kids, there are certain segments of the population that I'd be concerned about going down to four days. There are some kids who they really depend on that breakfast and lunch option that they get for free at school, and on Fridays and Saturdays and Sundays, if we go to a four-day, they would potentially not be getting much food. I've been volunteering with the Backpack Snacks program, which sends snacks home with kids who teachers have identified or might be in that position. And I know there's a lot of other kids who maybe haven't been identified or we don't know how well that's working. And I think it's an issue that we should pay attention to. I also know there's a lot of families who spending one more day a week that they have to pay for childcare would be very hard on them. Um, then there's a lot of people in the community where a four-day option would be very convenient. But for me personally, I don't think that convenience of X amount of people is worth the actual potential harm that could come to other kids, the kids that are the most vulnerable subset of our, of our community. I really think we need to be thinking about them, even if they're in the minority. And frankly, in this community, they may not actually be in the minority. So we really need to be focusing on them. Um, and then my other main concern is just curriculum being able to fit everything into such a shorter period of time. Yeah. Sorry, that's two minutes. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Well, Mr. House. So can, can you please address both of those issues? Mm -hmm. The, the, the uh, meal issue, we talked about that, and also the curriculum and the feeling that we're scrunching everything into a shorter amount of time. Um, I will. I will do my best to do that. Um, yeah, yeah. As far as curriculum is concerned, that can pose um, a problem, both um, positively and, and, and negatively. It really depends on on how you look at it. In in the four day option, some of the feedback and also some of the discussion that the board has had that in a four day option, it allows for more time for for preparation, and the argument can be made strongly that if I have more time to prepare, I can be more effective in the time that I have to teach that. So that argument can be uh, be made. The standards aren't going to change. Um, Arizona, the state of Arizona requires that the standards be taught and the testing window in April won't change. So those, those are some things that aren't variables to us. Um, having the professional time to be able to uh, more fully prepare to deliver that instruction, um, that's the variable and, and uh, that's what um, by having a, a four-day option where the teachers work 180 days, that's, that was the intent behind that, that option, is to allow that to happen. In the five-day option, that, that's addressed in the, um, the 20 additional work days that are there. Students are 160, um, and then the additional is there. 
So there, there's some variances in there. <coughs> as far as the, the food, it is, it is an issue. Um, and that's a concern that's always brought up, uh, especially around educators, because we care about kids, right? Um, we do have backpack lunches, as was, was stated. We do take those home, uh, we send those home with, with kiddos. Uh, we already provide uh, um, through the National School um, Lunch and Breakfast Program uh, things during the summer. That same program can be developed and, and ran out on Fridays, um, similarly. And, uh, and I mentioned in one of our public meetings that that's real easy to do in the, in the uh, Sholo um, Central, but how do we get out to the others? And we've, uh, we've explored those ideas and we, we've explored them in the summer and we'll continue to, to look at those. My, my team's looked at both options, five and four day, because there, there was a chance for both, right? So we've, we've looked at those options, we've explored them. Um, there have been talks out of White Mountain Lakes at the fire station on how can we deliver a, a remote location to deliver lunches and breakfast those days. Um, also, we've, uh, we've explored out in Pinedale and Clay Springs. How can we reach, because our district is really long and really narrow, how can we reach those, those pieces that are further out from us? Um, so those are the, the steps that we've tried to take um, in addressing that. Mr. Housley, how many uh, students right now participate in the, the backpack program? Um, I'm not sure exactly how many um, we, uh, we send to each side, but we, we have a tote um, that's jam-packed um, that goes home every to each site um, for the number of kids there. I'm not really sure exactly what what number of meals are in there. And how many? Mr. might be able to address that. What, what's the, I guess, the qualifications to receive the, those meals from, from the backpack program? I think it's just students that are identi identified by their site principals and others that work. What's our free and reduced lunch population? Uh, that's, a, that's a hard target. Um, we're currently rate, covering rate around 50%, um, but that, that number, um, the variance of that is that um, that only accounts for those who actually filled out and returned a free and reduced lunch application that actually qualified. <clears throat> Mr. Housley, on the four-day calendar, are we bringing kids in on Fridays? The intent of our plans are currently um, the site principals are working on what those plans look like exactly. And should you be in a four-day uh, position where you vote for a four-day, they'll bring those plans to you in March, in the March meeting. Um, but the intent would be that there are students that are falling behind or students that would like to even get ahead, right, as far as I'm, I'm achieving and I'm here, but I'd like to excel. Um, we need to provide some opportunities for them uh, to come in. Um, that is targeted, that is, that is meaningful to those, those children, um, but yet it doesn't take up the whole day because what we've said in both calendars that are proposed that we need to give professional time back to teachers. So you don't want that to, you don't want reteach to go on for six hours. If, if that's the case, we just need to modify our Friday that we currently have, and there's no need to change to it. What grade levels would have reteach? Uh, the intent would be to have that. Uh, throughout the system. And so if we're, are we busing in kids? We would run the buses on Fridays. Yes. And we would have meals on Fridays. Yes. Yeah. I have a, a quick question, uh, Mr. Housley. So it indic you indicated that we would have under a five day school week, we would have 20 work teacher work days, is that correct? Yeah, the one that reflects 160 days would be another 20, 20 teacher days. And so five, and five of those days are during the summertime, right? Right at the front and right before our school starts. Before the students are in the class. Okay. Can you share the start? Do you want to share the start dates and end dates for the different calendars? Yeah, so are we still in the public hearing or are we yes. like going to different? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're in the, and still in the public hearing. So if <clears> anyone <throat> would like to, I mean, they're welcome. Um, based on the feedback that we've received, one, one, the, the calendars that went out um, were the baseline for discussion as we went through. Um, one had, they had a couple variances were uh, the start date anywhere from the 10th to the 18th. Those were variances. And then the end dates, those were variances. 
there was the the holiday break that one calendar broke that in half and the, the others had it over the course of those two um, two weeks. And so um, currently in taking that into account, what's sitting in front of you right now is um, each of the calendars has a, a uh, August 17th start. Um, there is a slight variance at the end. Um, for instance, the five day week initially was a 14th, ending on the 14th to accommodate for that later start, it pushes it down to the 19th. So um, that was something that was kind of resounding. We wanted to start a little bit later. So if we started the 17th, which is reflected in the ones that are there um, in front of you right now, then that pushes the, the end date for the five day back um, to, a win, to the Wednesday the 19th. Um, the four day kind of reflects out. It looks exactly like it was, except for um, there was a lot of feedback over that holiday break. So what you see in front of you doesn't split it, it has it as um, and consistent. Both calendars have blacked out days for just professional development with no students? Yes. <clears throat> Can you tell us the results of the survey? So the, the survey was an op open platform, so people could respond as with their feedback, that's really the intent of the board was wanting to collect as much feedback as possible. And so um, you could receive multiple responses. Um, in those responses, we had, um, I'll just, I wish I could push it up and I'm sorry, I can't push it up onto the screen, but I'll, I'll pull it up for you right now. Um, we had approximately um, right around 80% of the, of the individuals who selected a survey um, either pick one of they picked one of the four day options, um, and the others um, selected obviously the five day options. That the other percentage did as as their preference. So there was an opportunity to select a preference and then select one that was least preferred, and um, that's kind of the percentage that reflected out there. When you um, did you survey the the staff too? It went out to um, all staff, went out to community members. Um, we had, uh, of the total number of uh, respondents to that survey, 60, about 62% of them were um, parents. Uh, we had 19% of the total were staff members, um, which we actually had, um, we have about 300 staff, and we had about 120 respondents that were staff members. But that was 19% of the whole survey. Um, we had about 11% students uh, participate, and then we had another um, 9 to 10% of uh, individuals who were community, community members without children in the system, and they responded. And do we have, did we differentiate between what the staff responses were and, and the other communities? Do you know what percentage wanted a four-day or a five-day? I, I don't have that specifically, um, but it was, have, it was way more on the four-day mm -hmm. side. So I just want to put my input in because I actually grew up in a four-day school week. Can you identify yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Victoria Hubbard. <laughs> so I actually went to a high-producing high school in, it was in Oregon, but um, I grew up with all four-day week, and we had the same thing where Fridays, kids who were falling behind would come in, that kind of thing. And from a personal experience, I would say I had a graduating class of like 50, so a little smaller than Sholo. But most of us went on to doing AP classes all throughout our junior, senior years. Um, I think, I don't know the number we were, but I know like in all Multnomah County, we were one of the top producing schools and we're like this tiny school, just kind of like Sholo. But um, we found that more people succeeded with the four-day work week. And I know that's speaking from a high school experience, but the grade school was the same as us. We were connected right next door. So that kind of thing. Um, and I do know some teachers personally. And I know that they work well into the night, late into the night, and over the weekends. And I personally think that they should have that day to better prepare for our kids. Um, mine's not quite in school yet. She'll be in kindergarten next year, but I still think of those things because it does affect her in the future. So that's just my input. <laughs> so when she goes to school uh, as a, a small child, are you still okay with a four-day week? I am because I think it's too much for them personally. 
I know that by even Thursday, my daughter's worn out from preschool. And I just think that it gives them more time to relax. They're little, even high schoolers, they have so much pressure on them to be this adult already, but it's a lot. And I just know that, I mean, personally, it worked really well for our school. All of us, most of us went on to amazing colleges or at least great careers or something. So, and I'm not, I don't know for sure if that's saying it's a four day week, but I know every time I went back on Monday, I felt refreshed. I felt like I could focus back in school again. Two days really isn't a lot. You need like one day to veg and then you're like, oh, you're already thinking about going back on Monday. So I don't know. And I, I really do think of our teachers because I do know a couple very personally and they honestly work more than I do. And it's, it's sad because they don't get paid what they deserve. So I think they need at least that day to prepare and have more breaks with their families of their own. So thank you. That's just my Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> my name is uh, Shraddha Brewer. Um, I'm a sophomore at Sholo High School, and I have been uh, I have been in Sholo uh, education for my entire life. Um, I actually recognize uh, some of my teachers here tonight, and uh, if you ask any of them, I'm not the most uh, participating of students. Um, <laughs> Uh, the five school, the five day school week. Um, to me, I just it it kind of like it, it affects my my everything. It, it affects my weekend. It affects my schoolwork. Uh, it affects the uh, it, it affects how I live. Um, whenever you know everyone has just hits everyone hits Tuesday and they're all like I'm I'm done. I can't go another day. And uh. And, uh, and that, that's true. Every, every day it feels like Monday because it's, it feels so long. And, um, and I, just, I just feel like a, a four-day four week would work better for everyone. Um, Carol ain't my president, but uh, I, I would vote for him. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, uh, I'm not... I'm not the uh, the best student, but I I do know that uh, I know I know what I want to do with my life, and I know that uh, you know being in being in Sholo, I know that like some classes uh, they don't they don't uh, value my education in some areas, um, and and what I want to do with my life, I know that uh, these classes they don't uh, they don't you know they don't uh, take, bring me closer to my goal of what I want to of what I want to do. Uh, I want to I want to be an actor. Uh, I want to be a director. Um, I want to take people to a different place when they go to movies. I want to I want to make them feel real, and uh, and that to me that that's always that's always been my dream, and um, you know just Schrader, yeah. That's two minutes. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Schrader. Madam President, I know there's been a, some comments and some questions, so I if I'd like to just uh, put this out there. Both of the calendars proposed are reduced from 180 days. And so, um, you know, we have um, less than 50% of our, our, our staff are teachers. So we have a large number of staff members who are hourly. And the question is, will it affect them? Uh, will it affect their take home and, and the number of hours that they get to work? And the answer um, from the get-go as you guys started to look at it and, and from the administrative side is we didn't want to sacrifice any of that. So uh, those employees would continue to still maintain the same level of, of services that they, they currently have. It would look a little bit different, but they wouldn't. 35 hours is 35 hours. 40 hours is 40 hours. And so uh, we feel like I wanted to make sure that that was known that either way, are we, you valued in, in either decisions our employees and wanting them to, uh, to maintain their, their current status. Hi, I'm Vanessa Kenny, and I really feel that either four or five day week, it's going to turn out fine. But my main concern, if we go to the four day week from a teacher's perspective, is I see our day already being chipped away at between meetings with our principal, with our team teacher, with students coming in to reteach. If the original purpose was for us to have that time 
to prepare and be ahead of ourselves for the following week. My concern is if I only get a two hour window on a Friday, that's not going to do me any good. And so my, that's my biggest concern is really what is our Fridays going to be made up of that it's not chipped away. And if we go to that four day week, Will there be another vote? Because with the two choices, one allowed teachers to have a possible three or four day um, weekend once a month. And as a parent, I would love to have that extra time with my family as well. And if it's the public, maybe they're um, voting on it, they're not going to take into consideration, you know, teachers um, and, and their time as well. So I'd want that to be taken into consideration with a four-day week calendar. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's my biggest concern, too. I love, as a teacher, I love the preparation time, and I would want our teachers to know that we trust that they are professionals, use that professional time wisely also, and um, I'm sure that there's going to be meetings but I hope that there's enough time. And then on the schedule that I'm looking at, the calendar, looks like there's at least one day a month. Am I looking at that right? Mm -hmm. Where everybody's off. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a no, whole. In, in, in the four day calendar that on you're the looking four, at. I'm looking at the four day calendar. So there's like one day every month, at least one. But all. But all school is like there's just no school that day. Yeah. So that. That's the only. The one that we have in front of us that Mr. Housley has brought to us is that way. Okay. And there's a four day and a five day that um, they have recommended to us. And they aren't the ones that were voted on, but he took the feedback from those and adjusted accordingly. <laughs> right? Is so, that what I'm seeing? So they're, they are the ones that everyone was looking at <clears throat> with minor adjustments, minor adjustments like the, the holiday the feedback breaks. from the best of both of the four day and the best of both of the five day, put them together with the feedback, for instance, a later start. So one of the days, one of them started on the, the 10th, and so the feedback was a little bit later started. So now all of them were on the 17th, right? So that, that was the adjustment based on the feedback that we've received at the public meetings. Um, and so it took the best, the feedback of the best of both of them, put them back, and that's what they have in But I, I think that that's going to be, um, like, if we, regardless, I think, of what which we approve, I think there's going to need to be an, a reevaluation, is what I'm hearing, on what happens on Friday, regardless. If we go to a five-day, what happens on Friday needs to change. And um, if we go to a four-day, what happens on Friday will change. So, But I like the, what I'm hearing is I like the, the time for reteacher enrichment on Friday. Isn't that what you said? That the kids will bust in and out. And then there'll be time for um, teachers to have their meetings, their PLCs. And, and then the other aspect, I don't know that we've talked about that yet, but the teachers were at the elementary level having subs on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Is that going to be moved to, to Fridays then so they can have that those same professional development things on Fridays. Yeah, so there was a couple purposes behind our professional learning institute, which we implemented three years ago, um, and it's just grown. And so what what the purpose was is so that um, our teachers, if they needed to get professional learning, we didn't have to send one or two of them off the off the mountain uh, for two days, because they'd have to travel down one evening after work, stay in a hotel, be at a training, travel back, so they would be out of the classroom. Uh, for two days, and we'd only send a couple. So the, the pebble we were throwing into the water was a small one, and we wanted to make that a little bit bigger and have more effect with our professional development. So we created the Professional Learning Institute. Well, as that's grown, what's happened is now we can, we can provide that opportunity, right, to keep people home, and we can, instead of having two people train in, we can train eight or 10 or, or more. Um, but what that does is when we offer that training, it, it is heavy on um, on the days that we offer that for substitute. And so the intent would be to offer those um, opportunities at different times uh, throughout the year on Fridays if we were in a, in a four-day model or if in the five-day 
sometime in those 20 other professional days so we can reduce the, the amount of time that our teachers have to stay out of the classroom. I, I want to note something that you, you brought up that we, it was brought up in our, our public meetings and, and I, I made the comment that really whatever schedule that we, we decide, there's, uh, when you talk about professional <clears throat> time and you talk about um, student achievement, those two things take a, a commitment and I like to think of it as a three-legged stool. Commitment from the school and personnel to have those things happen. Commitment from the community and parents to have those things happen. And or commitment from the students to make those things happen. If any one of those legs in the school or in the stool decide this isn't important, I'm not going to come in when I'm failing on Fridays. I'm not going. I'm going to. I'm going to miss all the all the days off uh, using leave time, or I'm going to. Um, not value uh, time that we set up for teachers to have professional time or whatever. If any of those um, fail, the stool is going to fall. So regardless of what calendar is chosen, the commitment from those three legs has to be there um, in order to make it work. And so I think that's to be said even in our 180-day calendar. But when you're making sacrifices to two these two priorities, I think it's even more important. How many days on each calendar are designated just for professional development, but there's no student? How many days are? Just professional development with no students, no reteach. Um, currently, they're um, on the four day that hasn't um, been fully developed yet. Um, the principals, um, we talked on, on Tuesday in our administrative uh, meetings and they are actually um, beginning those discussions or furthering those discussions where they are now. Um, so what the, that framework on a Friday looks like, if it if it's two hours when students are back, that still leaves a number of hours for uh, PLCs and professional learning. Um, certainly, I think the intent would be if it's in a four day to protect the time Monday through Thursday, and then utilize time. Um, effectively on that Friday. I know that doesn't necessarily answer with a definitive number, but there are um, 40 professional days in there, what those look like in the four-day option, and there's 20 professional days in the five-day. Five okay. So what the structure of those look like? But there's 20 days in the five-day that they're just for them, for the teachers. Yeah. They're not with students. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions from the board? Are there any, is there any other feedback from members of the community? Madam I'm President, seeing here. there's no other comments, you, it's now up to the board for decision and discussion. What do you think, John? I would like to. I would like to try the four day. Um, I feel confident in. <laughs> the decisions that our administrators have made as far as our teachers to trust them that they're going to utilize that fifth day or that Friday um, to better the children that will need a little extra and also better themselves. So I'm confident in them. Um, I would like to try it. Um, I know as an employee, I always liked a four-day week. Um, I never had it necessarily as a student in my youth, but um, I, would like, I would like to try it. I, I, I would also like to say that if it's not successful, we would, need to, we would need to make sure that we continue with our data and we make sure that we're successful because we cannot sacrifice uh, our teacher's professional development or especially our children's development so i'm 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 okay and i'm committed but if 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 we're not succeeding if this isn't helping us improve like we want it to and we hope it to then i i want to be sure and do what's right by the kids and and adjust as we need amy i feel the same way i um i was really actually surprised by the survey data 
that it was so high on the four day option for for everybody that surprising to me. Um, just as a, as a teacher, when I talked with a um, couple principals, so we've gotten letters from them. I feel like that's, um, I think that that's, they're excited about the options and the opportunities that it, it will pose also. Um, I'm thankful that we have an opportunity to bus kids in to help with, um, with the meals, with the instruction, the enrichment, the reteach. I, I think there's just a lot of opportunities. Um, I'd like to see where it goes. I, I would like to not sacrifice the, the student achievement either. I'm hoping that when we give a teacher and treat them as a professional and give them time as a professional to get their job done within their professional day, um, that they will see that we value them as a professional. I think it'll end up being better for our students when we do that instead of having to spend all your extra time after school or weeks before school even starts just to get your class ready, because I know our teachers out here do that. Um, and I appreciate that they do that because like, they care, they love our kids, and, and teaching is so important. So just personally, I, I love and value that professional time. Um, I'm, I, but I think it needs to be protected, too. So if we have kids in for a couple hours, then afterwards we really need to have a structure. And so I would challenge the administration to bring back a plan that we could share out. This is what the high school is doing. This is what the junior high is doing. This is what, because that's, I think, my goal is to value that professional time and say, hey, I value as a teacher, as, as, our, as a principal, and, and then look at what it will do for kids. I want to see um, students taught over content, that we're teaching our students, that we're looking at the data for our students and being able to adjust the content and the, the teaching accordingly. So that's what makes me excited about that. Um, but either way, either calendar, I think that we can do that on Fridays if we're just a little more creative with the, the five day. But I, I would lean towards the four because of the built in professional time. And it's really not a four. It's really a four with like this modified five is what it is. Okay. It's, it's kind of, it's almost a little bit close to our Make up four our own name. But four and a half day anyway, right? Or half day on That's Friday. what it feels like. We're, but I think technically, isn't it, but by the state, if we're doing four and Friday is optional, then we can do the, the 140 day, even though this is more than 140 days. But State law says you have to have a four day calendar or a five day calendar. Okay. When this was presented to the teachers, did they all know that every Friday and every grade level will be reteach for two hours? Or did they think Fridays were just for professional development? No, I don't, I don't know that it's been really defined exactly what Fridays are. So there have been um, no real firm discussions. There's been discussions around um, the circles about the need to help students. Uh, a student achievement can't be sacrificed, period. Um, now, if that, if that means that we uh, have a point where we don't have anyone that needs to improve, I mean, then we don't need to put things in place to help them improve. But um, we're not there yet, um, so there's going to have to be some, some semblance of having those needs met. And what that looks like, the site administrators will work with their teams to determine what so I, I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to interrupt because I know you're next and I know you have some thoughts but I'm worried that I saw some teachers' heads shaking out there. So are, are we still are we still able to yeah, yeah. hear from a, a teacher or two that shook their head that they're not they did not understand what this was about? You're gonna call people out of the crowd, John? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> can we zoom can just start call? naming names of who we want up here? Yeah. No, because I'm really bad with names. But you know who shook your head. I, I really would like you to tell me what you're thinking. Tell us. No. You have to come up and come on, say come your full here. name. You're okay. It's all right. It's uh, You know us all. I don't like it. She's not. I'm not going to embarrass you with her. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. If you have a really good story, go ahead. 
No. Um, my name is Patricia Kramer. I teach at Nicholas. Um, I just want the community and all of you know, we have built in an hour of reteach for reading and math for well, five days a week already. So having that fifth day would be great for prep, but having a fifth day of reteach and rich or just reteach is more work for us. So adding the extra prep time is great unless we're prepping for more work. <laughs> so but would you would you not do as much reteach on the four days and use the fifth day for that? Um, I would assume uh, personally, I would use a fifth day reteach as a targeted reteach for kids at specific foundational issues in their reading or math. But again, that's extra work that we're going to be using that extra um, prep time you're giving us for. So either we keep what we already currently have, which is reach each every day, math and reading, or um, I'm not sure why we're taking Fridays off. Kind of defeats Half the purpose. Or, or the four day. Um, why we're taking Fridays off to go to a four day. Okay. If we're going to just create another day of lessons for us to prep for. So we, I know we've been crying for prep time, so I really appreciate all of you guys who are fighting for us to have that prep time. Um, but the reteach at an elementary level, which looks different than a high school level, we're already doing that. So we're, I guess we're confused why that's become such a big issue for Fridays now. I think that would be something that the, if we choose to go to that type of a, a four day schedule with reteaching mm -hmm. enrichment, the principals would come back and say, this is what's going to work best for my school. Mm -hmm. um, we can move forward this way. And I hope we'd have your support and the community support knowing that we're doing what's best for the kids. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and I'll Thank say, I'll, I'll jump in there too. I was at all of the community meetings and I think where that came from is I think a lot of people are worried about students falling behind with going from a 180 day calendar right now down to 100. I think the one that we currently have is 144. Mm -hmm. And so they were worried about that class time. And then there's other people who feel like there's the, there's some students who are um, high achievers that don't that Friday is a wasted day for them and you guys are finding busy work for them anyways on some Fridays or at least not your grade but other students or other okay. other faculty members are <laughs> and I know for myself I have a I have three kids into like and my son's the one who spoke earlier that Friday is basically a wasted day for him so the idea was that that the model would be that there would be a reteach for those students we didn't we were concerned about um, those kids falling behind or the kids who um, who wouldn't uh, be at the at the level that they needed to? We wanted to have them uh, have the opportunity to be able to get back into the classroom and get, uh, you know, have reteach or enrichment or whatnot. And so that's where that idea had came from throughout the whole um, uh, the whole district. And I know that in my discussions with other, I, I reached out to other superintendents from uh, the region who went to a four day. Uh, some of them are are disappointed that they don't have a reteach or an enrichment program on their Fridays. Some of them have gone to, uh, uh, you know, Fridays, the school is closed down and you can't get back in. And, and so that's why the idea was for the entire district, we wanted to have at least that option so that we could address the concerns of those children who might um, be, you know, the most vulnerable. Even if you're not reteaching for your class on Fridays, my understanding is that students would have the option to come in. So I guess I'm a little unclear. I definitely that, don't. So. Yeah, I definitely don't want to become a glorified babysitter. So okay. if it was truly structured Fridays, I'm sure a lot of teachers would be on support with whatever is decided. But we are really looking forward to true prep time. I come in every weekend and we're we just most of us just left school. So I mean, you need it. We you do need, need it. it. And, and I, I think know what that's going to look like. So. so when you guys were looking at the calendar, did you think every Friday was just no students? When you voted on it? On an elementary level. On an elementary level. I understand the high school, especially, you know, Snowflake has a model of this. Other districts have a model of it. Um, we thought maybe the high school would have that. We were not sure. And I'm speaking from me, so please don't think I'm representing every teacher in, in our district. So thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm Kevin Hall, principal at Nicholas Homestead Elementary. I'll speak for myself, what I've communicated. I have not communicated to the K-5 teachers or my teachers that we would be in session on a Friday. 
my communication has been that we use Fridays for professional. If the charge is for us to use Fridays for professional or for intervention, then I would have to take that charge and go to work and we would have to organize them. But we have not been looking at the four day option at the elementary level as reteach and enrich. I just want to communicate that. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks. Yes. Mrs. Yeah. Costray, how about how about you? Were you okay? Okay. Where's our junior high? Where's our other? Oh, there you are, right next to them. Did, was that your understanding too? <laughs> Abby Hall, principal at Whipple Ranch. <clears throat> I'm in agreement too that. Um, something that keeps going through my mind, it was, a, we talked about it at admin meeting a few weeks ago. You either spend your time on mastery or you're going to spend all your time on interventions. And when we don't have a lot of prep time for our teachers, for them to actually work hard at creating lessons that have a lot of rigor that would get students to mastery, we end up creating schedules that provide a lot of interventions because that's what kids are needing. And if, I don't know how we use Friday to bring groups of kids back in for reteach and enrich, and also at the same time provide professional time for teachers. Because it's exactly like Ms. Kramer said, it's one more thing they're prepping for. In my mind, we met together as the elementary principals this week to talk about what would our schedule look like if a five-day week was chosen, and what would our Fridays look like if a four-day week was chosen. And we discussed that we don't want to tell teachers kids can't come in, we would like to give that opportunity to the teacher if they have a student that they feel they really could make growth with, or two or three students that are struggling in the same area, allow that teacher to use some of her prep time on Friday to choose to invite those three students or two students or one student in and work individually with them in a way that they couldn't during a five-day school week. Not that we have a scheduled amount of time where students, they're required to bring in intervention students because we do do it for a minimum of an hour a day every single day. So I don't see the need for that extending to Fridays for large groups of students. But if you bring a student in, you have to take them home. Exactly. So there's a time frame mm -hmm. that they, a window that would need to be consistent district wide. Mm -hmm. Exactly, right? so for busing purposes. For busing purposes. Yeah. yeah, so for busing purposes, if you were going to bring students in, you wouldn't want the high school having intervention in the morning and the elementary providing it in the afternoon, it wouldn't be feasible for busing. So there would have to be a set amount of time unless those teachers were to, willing to work that their prep time was at the same time intervention was being offered at junior high and high school level, um, that I believe don't have the same opportunities the elementary does to offer intervention every day. Say that and, one more time. Pardon me? Say that one more time. If there was a block of time that was the same as the, at the junior high and the high school for intervention, if during that time teachers knew if they needed to work with students, that was the time that we would bust those students in. That it wouldn't be at a different time than what other schools were offering for intervention. So you're in, I'm just wanting to make sure because I was under the impression that all schools were going to bring kids in if they needed help. No. So that's, but that's what I, like, that's when I looked at this, that was the plan, I was told. Um, so what you're saying is you want the option to bring the teachers, if they have a few students they want to bring in, they can. But it would need to be the same time district-wise, like 8 to 10 or, or something. It would have to accommodate have transportation to for students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And meals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then if you do, if you bus a student in for breakfast, and then they're in intervention, and they also stay for lunch, you have your breakfast at your 7.30 to 8 o'clock time, and your, <laughs> lunch, your lunch, the there's home, your right? whole morning for a teacher. Mm -hmm. And if we are currently saying teachers still leave early on payday Fridays, you're only having two extended Fridays a month, and if their morning is sending intervention, the teachers are still getting the same amount of prep time they get at our current schedule, which is just a few hours in the afternoon on a Friday. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, no. 
I'm Becky Clark. I'm the junior high principal. You all got a memo from me that outlined the discussion that the junior high staff had about two and a half weeks ago about the calendar options that were put out um, along the lines of student achievement and professional time for teachers. Um, I feel like where we came from um, in terms of academic achievement, where we've come from in the last four years is astounding really, from where we were. Um, in my previous position as curriculum director, I had the opportunity to study those academic trends and um, our lack of response over an extended period of time as a district. And I say we because I was teaching then in a classroom. Um, and I feel like the gains that we've made in the last four years are exponential. What the elementary principals and the elementary teachers have described as um, Debbie talked about mastery. That's true. And the time that you put in in a classroom teaching to mastery is valuable. But where we are as a junior high school right now is um, about six years behind where they are because the students that are coming to us, some of them were still trapped in that system where they have some gaps in their achievement. And so we spend some time um, trying to work to make up those gaps. Um, Debbie talked about, you know, having time built into the academic day for um, K-5. Mrs. Kramer talked about that also. At the junior high school, um, we worked really hard with our master schedule last year to build in a 25-minute reteach period for math. And um, kids that need, much like what we're talking about here for Fridays, our junior high kids do that for math on a weekly basis. And we identify them weekly or sometimes um, every two weeks, and then they um, have this 25-minute intervention period every day. So when we talk as a junior high staff through those four-day calendars, the teachers see the need for professional development. Um, I feel like the sentiment I heard from them <coughs> was that they want professional development that's more differentiated to their needs um, and that it would be possibly at a school level um, or that things offered by the district would be differentiated and they would have choice. But the reality is, um, by and large, in a four-day week for students, the staff at the junior high would like to see those kids back um, that need some of that intervention for Friday. What that model looks like, I don't know. Um, we were given a um, kind of opportunity from Mr. Housley in our meeting this week to think about um, what that might look like should you all choose to vote for a four-day calendar tonight um, and that we would need to start kind of moving in that direction for planning. And so I laid that in front of my leadership team, which is teachers and, and school admin and so forth on Wednesday night when we met, um, but we have some ideas about not just reteach, but also enrich, and some opportunities for junior high school kids that we can't build into the regular school day that possibly could happen on a Friday um, in this blocks of time that we're talking about. And I feel like um, if I was a parent and not a member of the Shola Unified School District staff, I might be concerned about what's that gonna look like it's a little bit hard to talk about it in abstract, right? I mean, and that's what you all are, that's the challenge you all have tonight is to vote on a calendar with this kind of an abstract. But I can speak for kind of that junior high piece and say that um, we welcome the opportunity to have kids back in the secondary setting to do some intervention on Fridays that we can't, just can't physically fit into our regular school day um, because of requirements from the state but um, that the teachers also would enjoy some professional development time. It will look different than it would in a K-5 level as it does now that we do on a school basis. So um, I just wanted to, you know, kind of mention that we're, we're talking about what that could look like. And I do want you to know that if you choose to go to a five-day calendar to speak to Hale's point, um, it's a valid one. And what kind of curriculum and services are we providing on Fridays now? If we, at the junior high, were presented with a five-day option for next year, our Fridays will look different anyway, because we are feeling a need to provide better services. Thank you. Thank you.
want to have Mr. Marchand come down just to round it out with all of our <laughs> There's no, Ollie can talk. <laughs> Um, I guess it's my turn to speak. I'll, I'll say I, I'm in favor of the four-day option. Um, I think that Mr. Halsey did a great job as far as um, outlining the two goals when we looked at the four-day and the five-day. The first one was teacher development and academic achievement. Um, I look at the five-day calendar, and I just don't see that we accomplish teacher professional development. Um, and we give them 20 days, and five of those days, which is 25% of the days that we give them, are um, before the students even get there. And so what I've heard from the teachers is, I need prep time and I need time to reevaluate and look at, at data and do that. And we take and the, the professional development days that we do give them, the lion's share of them happen before the school even starts. And so it doesn't it doesn't seem to me that we are actually truly giving them teacher professional development. And then you factor in, um, you know, the, that um, um, some of those days are on Fridays where it could be students aren't there, but they're leaving at half of a day with the uh, with um, because it might be a payday, and so they're leaving at, at twelve o'clock, one thirty. Um, and I just don't think that we accomplished that portion of the goal. Um, I think that in the five day we've had, I, I think the main concerns that I've heard. Um, what about food for the students? And I think that we've we've looked at and at least partially addressed that, and we're in the process of doing that. Um, we've looked at the um, ability to fit the curriculum into that time frame, um, and I think that that's why it's critical that we have um, some type of reteach and enrichment. I think that that's critical in order to make this successful. And how that looks, I think that, like we've said, we we give the the superintendent and the principals that charge to go forward and see how that looks, and we entrust them as professionals. Like, what does a reteach look like at uh, at Debbie School at Whipple Ranch is going to obviously look different than what Becky has at, at the junior high, and so we entrust them to to figure out what plan and they want to bring back to us next month to say this is how we'll reteach and this is how we'll utilize um, and do the enrichment on those Fridays. And you know, they they're the professionals. Like Kevin, your your junior high may not, or your uh, Nicholas Homestead, it may not need um, the reteach that we're talking about because it sounds like the ladies in the fourth grade are already doing an excellent job at that. And you may not need that, right? Like that may be something, but it sounds like Mrs. Clark, you're telling us that you would like that enrichment and that. And so. I'm I'm not an I'm not a uh, a teacher by practice so or a uh, a principal so I would I would leave that in the, the hands of the competent individuals who we entrust and uh, to do that and then the other thing was childcare and um and I and I can definitely um, understand that that's something that is uh, that 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 could be problematic I know that when the district decided to go to half days that was a concern that came about was what are we going to do with childcare um, and and I don't think that the uh, the the doom and gloom that kind of was portrayed at the time of uh, of the half day on Fridays ever came to fruition. Um, but I also know that I don't want to I don't want to be um, pulled to that uh, demographics to those people. And so I think that uh, you know I I personally have reached out to um, some members of the community through the the director of the early child development through MPC. Um, I've reached out to people in the Holbrook School District. They have embedded childcare within their district. Um, at least I don't I don't know that that's something that we I'm committing to doing tonight, but I I think that it, at least it's worthwhile that looking into and to alleviate that that concern and to see if there's a possible solution to that. Um, and so I think the three main or four main concerns of the five day uh, we're trying to actively address, and I think that the, that that those concerns uh, from the community have not fallen on deaf ears. I think that that the the district has really um, has really weighed in with this. And I just think that the in order to achieve uh, the two goals that we set out with teacher professional development and academic achievement, I think that the four day option is the best option for us as a district. And I'll and I'll say too, you know, I I just like to thank the members of the community for participating. I think we've had an overwhelming success um, as far as getting the feedback from the community. Um, we've had surveys, we've had community meetings, we've had people here tonight. Um, and so I just want to tell everybody thank you for coming and participating and and uh, giving us the information so that we can make an informed decision. And I mean, you know, with the survey at 85%, I think that as an elected representative from that body of people, I think the people have spoken very clearly to me as an individual. So I like I like the four day option as well. I, I don't think that it's without some there'll be some work involved. Um, I think our first tendency when we think woohoo, four days of school, we forget that, you know, there is that reteach and enrich part. And I don't want um, 
anybody to overlook the part that there will be a lot of work involved in making that successful. Um, maybe more work involved than what it takes to accomplish it in five days. Um, so I don't want, you know, first and foremost, I don't want that to be forgotten that there'll be a lot of effort put in. There's been a lot of effort put into getting to this point, And there's so many things in the dark that if we go that way, that we have to explore and we have to try, and we have to put in place. We've never done this before. So we have to find what will make those things effective. Um, it just, you know, we, like it's been said, we need to put our trust in our administrators and, and the faculty that they can make it happen. They, they're trained professionals. Okay. On the odd man out, I like the four day, but I think that we should study it more because we have all these unanswered questions. And the five day gives them 20 professional days that are just for teachers. Because, you know, if you're reteaching, you're not just getting a day for professional development. And I just think we really need to support our families to have successful students. So you're saying you want to show this and look at I'd it some like, more? or I'd like everyone to study it this year and bring it back to us in the fall. Not give us two four-hour study sessions. Figure it out. Not have all the what-ifs. So you want to maintain the current schedule, so to speak? for next year well, with, the and, with the modifications, but I support what the board decides. I see Stacy's concern. Um, I think, you know, there's so many unknowns, so many areas to explore. Um, at the same time, I think we could spend a lot of time doing a lot of research and still wind up right back here at this point with what we have. And um, that would be my worry. Mm -hmm. I, th I think we should. If we're going to go for it, let's go for it and, and start trying to make it happen. Yeah, that's I, I would agree with Daryl. I think that um, we, if we're going to make a decision, we want to get as much information as possible, and I think we've done that. And I think that we've, in my discussions with our administrative team, um, they have indicated to me that they are in favor of a four-day as opposed to the five-day. And that, in, in my mind, builds a lot of trust because I, I trust those individuals to make those type of decisions. And if you're going to, if we're going to go to, uh, if we're going to, because we're really not go, staying with what we have, I mean, the status quo would be to have 180 days this calendar. We're going down to 160 uh, with a five day and a, and a whole, whole bunch of time built in where, well, and, and it's not, I, I, don't, I don't know that it's a true, we give them a true 20 day professional development days. We give them five days before the students ever get into the class. So 25% of those are, are not really prep time and development during the year to, to focus in and deal with their students. And so I, I believe that, um, that we have enough information to make an informed decision and, and move forward with a, with a four day. It's, at this point, I would I would make a motion that we would approve the uh, the calendar the four day calendar as as it as it has been proposed um, that the start date would be on August seventeenth for the school year that the end date would be on May twenty seventh that the breaks would coincide with this calendar and that there wouldn't be any significant deviation from what's been presented to the board um, and that we would uh, move to a uh, a four day uh, school week next year and give the charge to the uh, administrative team to come back with. Uh, a model next month with what uh, Fridays look like as far as a teach, reteach, and enrichment for each of their individual schools. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Me. <laughs> Motion passes. Um, item 3.3 .3. Legendary staff, it's almost time for you to retire. You've been here so long. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Hall will bring you up first. This fine lady. <laughs> this is Annette Infield. 
<clears throat> Annette is one of our second grade teachers at Whipple Ranch. She's been a teacher for 15 years, and we've been lucky enough to have her with us for the last three years. Uh, she is a highly effective teacher that is very well known for her organizational skills. I keep asking her to offer classes. Um, her knowledge of the standards and experience with classroom management. She is the coach for PBIS, which is our positive behavior program, the grant that was granted to our school a couple years ago. Um, and she spends many hours outside of work planning and preparing trainings for staff. All of this is done without any complaint or any additional compensation on her part. Her team members value her input and have the following to say about her. Annette is amazing and incredibly organized. She is always there to help and has great ideas to share with us. No matter how busy she is, she always takes time to listen to my worries. She gives us great advice and she answers our many questions. She is definitely a step above when it comes to organization and planning. I often think, what would Annette do to make this organized? And then I go and do that. <laughs> Annette has a natural ability to lead as well as endless knowledge when it comes to standards, rigor, and expectations. She is very approachable and always has a listening ear. I believe all that know Annette would say they are blessed through their association with her. She is a cheerleader for public education and teachers. She truly loves children, and it shows daily in all that she does. Annette is an amazing choice for legendary staff because she is an all-around legendary person. I just personally want her to know how grateful I am. As my first year in the school, she has been invaluable to me to help me learn the culture and where the school was and where we want to go. And I, I appreciate that in her. So thank you very much. Okay. Because we're worried Good evening. Faculty and staff of Linden Elementary School would like to honor Dina Miller as our legendary staff member. Dina teaches one of our two kindergarten classes at Linden. She is a lead mentor for our robotics group and a valuable member of our learning community. Teachers at Linden appreciate Dina for her dedication to her students and the craft of teaching. Her colleagues mention her willingness to share resources, her sense of humor, and her kindness. I would like to thank Dina for being a resource to me. She has been at Linden long enough to know. Um, she's one of the, the keepers of our traditions and our routines and our rituals at our school. Her memory of how things have been done in the past and students have, have already passed through our halls have been a great asset to this new principal. So we at Linden are proud to have Dina Miller at our school. I have a huge list of things that her colleagues have shared with her. Um, Dina lives and breathes Linden Elementary. Her dedication to the robotics club is so evident. She throws herself wholeheartedly and provides an opportunity for students to challenge themselves through success and failure alike. Dina's work ethic is beyond measure. She works long beyond her required hours, is a friend to many, and always a willing resource to those in need. She is loved by her students and appreciated by her coworkers. Here's my favorite. In no particular order, awesome, amazing, tireless, enthusiastic, ever smiling, inspiring, thoughtful, frank, and funny, and so much more, really. It's great she's getting some well-deserved recognition. Dina Miller.
Um, next, we'll have Mr. Marchant. All right, Mr. Housley, members of the board, I'm honored to present to you Mrs. Krista Rask as the Shola High School Legendary Staff Member for this month. Uh, Krista has been with Shola High School for 13 years as a guidance counselor and told me that she intends to work here until I retire. So I'm, exci <laughs> I'm excited about that. I don't remember hearing you saying that. <laughs> yeah, no, she, she said it, she said it. Um, she serves <clears throat> all of our special education population as well as, as well as a large number of our general education students. Yet she knows the names of all of our students, which is a testament to her passion for building relationships. Um, as a new school principal, I'm discovering that I need counsel more than I ever have before. And Krista has been able to provide this for me on a regular basis. Uh, she is trustworthy, kind, empathetic, and extremely competent. If anyone is in need of solutions, Krista can be counted on to be honest yet respectful. Um, she has mastered the ability to defend her position with passion while still listening to the opinions of others and remaining open to the ideas that were not her own. Uh, most importantly, at the end of the day, we can all trust that Krista will support the decision that has been made and will do everything in her power to make it a success. And this is what makes her such an incredible asset to our leadership team. In speaking with students and staff about Krista Rask, one person said that she is an extremely hard worker that always focuses on what is best for our team. Uh, another person shared how great her impact has been through running Teen Court and mentioned that multiple people from the community have shared how great it was to work with Krista as the lead of Teen Court and that it's changing the lives of both the members of the club and the students uh, given the opportunity to go through Teen Court. Uh, lastly, I had a female say that, quote, Mrs. Rask is literally who I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> so uh, those are impressive compliments for an impressive employee. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Rask, for all you do for everyone at Shoal High School. Oh, thank you. Mr. West. Members of the board, Mr. Housley, I'd like to present to you today Mrs. Roxy Price as the transportation um, legendary staff member. And one of the reasons that I chose Mrs. Price is um, this year, we've done a Be Kind initiative district-wide. Um, and you would think that would mostly be in a school. Um, Mrs. Price took that to a different level because as a, as a transportation department, the students see the bus drivers first, and they see them last. And if we're going to be kind in the classroom, we have to be kind to them on the school bus as well. And her students on her bus, um, let me just read what a bus driver said about that first, if I don't get it out of context. It says, Mrs. Price does so much that makes the transportation department run more effectively. Her ability to be a positive influence in the lives of the children that ride the buses is her most important contribution to Sholo schools. She looks for the best in each child and helps them to see it too. She is constantly looking for the good in the things that they do and encouraging the good, day, good in positive ways. Please sit down. You are so good at what the individual child is doing right. She redirects negative behavior towards positive choices. Her healthy influence becomes a strength to the children. Her example also strengthens her coworkers, parents, and others she comes in contact with. She deserves this recognition, and she continues to get better. Um, something I really appreciate as a director is when I was in school, we had a teacher that every day there was a new saying or slogan in the classroom. In our department, she on her own dime 
goes out and buys different little trinkets and she makes them. She she has a thing in the break room that says spread joy like confetti. Um, she's always putting out positive statements so that as as we walk through the department we we have that reminder. Um she she has taken the initiative 110% like she does with everything else. Um, a couple more things I want to read from some staff members. Um, is Roxy is a very hardworking person. She is always helpful and thoughtful to everyone she is around. She is very positive and uplifting. She is great to work with. Another staff member says, I think that Roxy should receive this award because of the hard efforts that she puts into making this a better place to work. For trying to boost morale and spreading kindness to everyone. And then another staff member says, um, you can read the first part, but um, she's the White Fleet Queen. Um, we did a, um, this year, one of, our, one of our other initiatives was, our White Fleet's not in very good condition. Teachers come, it might be dirty. There might not be fuel in it. They've got places to go. So we've kind of done the whole enterprise slogan, except the part where we pick you up. She ensures every single day when she comes to work that every white fleet, she had, there's a board in my office, she checks it. She gets the keys to the vehicles that need to go out. She gets them fueled. She gets them washed. Um, she organizes some of the special needs drivers as they're waiting for between their morning run and their midday. These staff members do this task, and she encourages them to get it done. Um, this person finishes off by saying she always she's always busy cleaning and fueling the white fleet she's the most positive person on this planet which is needed in our department congratulations roxy um and then i just want to say is um i've learned from mrs price that it doesn't matter what's happening in your day she smiles at everyone I look forward to her coming off of her morning run because my office sits where when they walk in the door, I can see them. And every morning when I walk her, I watch her walk in. It puts a smile on my face because I know that the children of Sholo Schools are in great hands with Mrs. Bryce. Mr. Hall. Mr. Housley, members of the board, I you know it takes a lot of parts to make a school great. Tonight, I wanted to recognize somebody from our cafeteria. Um, we have 54% of our students on a free and reduced lunch. And there's a lot more students than that that eat a lunch every day. So it's, it's so important that uh, what we provide for them is uh, not only something that they enjoy, but it helps them stay focused and enjoy the school day. So I, that's why I would like to recognize Mr. Chad Powers tonight. Um, Jeff Houston, who's our food service director, um, says this about Chad that I'd like to share. Chad Powers has been part of the food service staff here in the Sholo Unified School District for over 11 years now. Chad is known throughout our department as a steadfast and reliable asset and worker. I have observed Chad several times over the last four years, and the defining trait that I see demonstrated over and over again is Chad's devotion and pride towards providing students with nutritious meals that help them strive their very best during the school day. Other staff members um, on our campus say that he cares about how the food tastes, and he works hard to make sure the kitchen and the cafeteria is um, This is something that I love about Chad. 
I love the fact that he cares enough to notice a child either didn't eat or is hungry, and he shares that with me in a private way. I think that's just marvelous. It allows me to check on that student. <clears throat> Nicholas Homestead Elementary is well served by Chad's calm and continuous efforts to provide the highest quality, not only in the food that he prepares, but the service that he provides our students and staff. So I want to say thank you, Chad, for being a legendary staff at Nicholas Homestead Elementary. <clears throat> Mrs. Clark. I might need a police escort out of here tonight because Mr. Barnes isn't super happy that I uh, asked him down here and then we had this extra long meeting. So <laughs> the favors are just piling up on me. Uh, Mr. Housley and governing board members, this is Mr. Jeff Barnes. He is the band and orchestra guru of Sholo Junior High School. Um, Mr. Barnes is passionate about music and about growing the band and orchestra programs in the Sholo Unified School District. When gaps in academic achievement created a need for a complete overhaul of the junior high's master schedule last spring, Mr. Barnes parten partnered with school administration to create opportunities for students to participate in music classes, and it was no small feat. He spent lots of hours in meetings with uh, Mrs. Alsobrook and myself, provided feedback and proofreading draft schedules, and finally agreed to a consensus on the final product. His support of academics is meaningful, but I think what's most exciting about Mr. Barnes' take on education is that he has the perspective that music education is an integral part of developing a well-rounded student. Mr. Barnes is a master teacher, not only in terms of teaching instrumental skill, but also with regard to his classroom management. He is relentless in his pursuit of excellence. One innovative strategy he uses is to have students audition in for concert performances. By so doing, Mr. Barnes creates student buy-in to a high quality production. This is evidenced not only by the level at which students perform, but also by their behavior at concerts while waiting in the audience. Quite remarkable. When you attend a Sholo Junior High School band or orchestra concert, try closing your eyes when you listen to the music. I think you'll agree that it's hard to believe the performers are still in middle school. A friend and associate of Mr. Barnes recently said this to me, we've never seen a junior high director anywhere close to as good as Jeff. And I wholeheartedly agree and value his contribution to the music programs of Sholo Unified School District and the students of Sholo Junior High School. <laughs> like any good music director, he plugged his concert March 10th, 7 o'clock. <laughs> awesome. Okay, Mr. Schubert. Uh, okay. <laughs> Today, for my legendary staff member, I'd like to present um, Miss Lori Douglas. <laughs> Lori is the accounts payable clerk for the Sholo Unified School District. And I, I say the accounts payable clerk, but I mean guru. Anything about purchasing, Lori is your person to go to. Ask any finance secretary in the district that calls her five to ten times every day. Um, there's a lot of things that we couldn't do within the district office without having Lori present. 
Um, just yesterday, Lori talked me out of a bad decision in dealing with the, a preschool project. With Lori's help and guidance, we're able to do something proper within that program. Um, Lori is one of those people that I use as a sounding board. Um, anytime that something new or different comes up, she's the person that I want to talk to about that this idea and make sure that we're within the, the way things need to be done to do this. And since she's not here, I'll go ahead and give her that hug that she wouldn't take. <laughs> and I present to you Lori Douglas. Members of the board, um, I'd like to take the opportunity. I haven't had a chance to do this in the last couple of years, so I'm going to take the chance today to introduce a, um, a legendary staff of my own. Ask Ms. Cosgrave to come on up uh, for me, please. <laughs> Ms. Cosgrave is um, in her third year here in our district. Uh, she's uh, been in some districts from uh, southern Arizona. She was in Round Valley, and thank goodness we stole her. Um, she came into work at Linden, and uh, very early, I saw something uh, very special about Miss Cosgray and her approach with kids and her understanding of of how kids learn. And um, uh, we invited her in her second year to be the principal at Linden to grow that school and to uh, take us um, to a different place. And she. As we sat, it, it resonated with me that the vision that she had for where she wanted to help Linden grow. At the time, they were a D school. Um, uh, things uh, had gone away from where they were were before for whatever reason, and and she was excited about the opportunity to, to help bring that vision back. Uh, in her in a short two years, her her school has gone from that point to this year being labeled. Um, and a and one of the top performing elementary schools in uh, the northeast region of the state. So we're very excited about that. Perhaps all of those accolades are, are nice and they, they feel good and, and certainly things to strive for, but perhaps more meaningful are the things that um, her staff have said about her. And uh, this is indicative of, of her leadership. Charla has been the, by far the best, best principal I've ever worked with. She is supportive, understanding, open, and truly cares about not only the kiddos at our school, but our awesome staff. I'm proud to work with Charla at Linden Elementary. There are so many things that I, I admire about Charla, so I will take just a few minutes to mention some of them. One, she's very dedicated. She's very organized and methodical. And that is absolutely true. Everything has a drawer, a place. <laughs> Maybe Miss Enfield and her should get together. Um, number two, she's very motivating to her staff members and encourages them to always strive to be their best. Three, she handles tough situations with kindness. Her smile can brighten rooms. Lastly, Charla has a great, uh, has been a great change for our school and has made tremendous changes to help with class size, teacher schedules, and improving our school grade. With data support, she has always uh, she has a way of making you feel like we're truly valued as staff members and as a person. She's not only a kind person but a wonderful principal. She is a strong instructional leader and understands how to get younger kids to learn. She's supportive and always makes you feel that way. Charla is a true leader. She understands the demands that teachers are under. She's supportive, empathetic, encouraging, caring, and kind. She also has a great vision and ability to help us see and work towards that vision for the benefit of those of our students. She makes Linden enjoyable. And I just wanted to share one comment that I was standing with her in a, at, a, at an event and one of the parents came up and, and complimented her on something. He says, you know, every morning I see you out there at the drop off, cold, whatever it is, you're out there with a smile on your face, greeting kids. She truly cares about the kids of Linden and her staff, as you've heard in the the reflection. That's why she's our legendary staff. This Thank you.
Item 3.4, Linden Robotics Team will present to the board. Are they, yeah, are they still awake? Right. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Dina Miller, and this is just a few of our 20 members this year. We, uh, we got ambitious and invited 20 kids this year. Um, so we brought um, a few of our members tonight to share their robots, talk a little bit about their experience, and um, to show off the four trophies we've already won this year. So um, we'll start with the four trophies. We buried them in here somewhere. <laughs> so one of our trophies, um, is the Excellence Award. Um, this was won by the Yellow Submarine. We have a couple of the members down there. Um, the Excellence Award is an overall award. It's the highest award you can win in a competition. It means that your um, team has done an outstanding job in not only autonomous programming to get your robots to drive by themselves, in teamwork, in um, your design, in your notebook, and in your overall program, because I also encourage my kids to do the STEM project. Um, so all of our six teams have done the STEM project and um, submitted that to the judges as well. So uh, we won this Excellence Award. We won a second Excellence Award. So we have two Excellence Awards this year. Um, this one was by the Airsoft Munchkin team, or Munchkin, Munchkin Airsoft. Airsoft. <laughs> Sorry, they get to name themselves. They're quite clever. <laughs> I can never remember what they are. Um, so these two awards have um, earned two of our teams a spot at state and we will be going on February 29th down to Goodyear to compete in a state competition. So they're super excited about that. Um, we also won the, um, the STEM research project and this was, um, tell me your name again, Code Breakers. <laughs> the Code Breakers um, won the STEM project award. Um, they designed a small robot to collect temperature data and um, they would take it out in the morning and again at recess to see if the temperature was um, conducive to allowing students to go outside or whether it was too cold. And so they presented that to the judges um, through a YouTube video is how they do that. So they were awarded the STEM project. The judges were um, very impressed in how they had problem solving skills because uh, their robot ended up falling apart and not functioning partway through their project. But they uh, were super proud of how they overcame that. And then our last one, um, we also got another STEM project award. So we have two excellence awards and another STEM project award um, for another group that did some research on how robotics is used to help better our future. So um, I'm going to allow the kids to kind of talk to you a little bit for a minute about their robots and their design they chose. And I promise we won't take too long because we've been here a long time already. <laughs> So this is our robot. Um, at first it wasn't like this, but we made changes. We made a couple of changes. The wheels are bigger. Made the arms. The, arms are different. the wheels, and it couldn't lean back as far as it can now. We had a motor, but what we were really proud of it because now it can stack the high point cubes, the green cubes, which is the high points, and we're super excited for state because. We thought we were going to fail, and then we overcame that failure challenge and got our robot. Yep. So, thank you. Can you show, it us, show us how it works? Uh, uh, yeah, we'll hold it. Help you go. <clears throat> Watch out the program. Watch out for the program. Yep. So Bridger, while he's doing that, what do you? how many people are on the team that created this? Um, it's us three. So there's a three-man team that works together? Yeah. Great. Well, um, Code Breakers. Was a four team, the only four team. Okay, great. So every team has to have two drivers. Mm -hmm. um, during a tournament, they work together with another team. Mm -hmm. Was it a competing against them? They work together. 
So that works with two other members from another school to earn. Well, that's great. So, um, cool. have to have two drivers because they get 30 seconds to drive. Mm -hmm. and they have to switch drivers and during the call. During the competition. One minute. Oh, cool. So now is the whole team going to state, or is it so just? So those three, that whole team, and then there's another member of their team. Oh, great. That's great. We're not taking over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Do you guys want to show yours? Sure. Well, there's nothing else. Oh. So at the first point of robotic, we had this robot named Ike, and we discovered that in the first competition in White River, it didn't do so good. So we came back and um, redesigned it into that. It took five tries to get to that. <laughs> so the amazing thing about them is that they're always overcoming problems every time we meet. We only meet once. <clears throat> Hours, and we have to figure out a lot of things. It's really fun to see how much to grow and just learning how to code and program and what design is going to work best. And then when we go to a competition, we just spent three months building this and it really only got us two points and that wasn't very good. How can we fix it? Um, so it's really fun to see them problem solve and still work all of that. We work very hard. How many competitions do you go to besides state? We only go to Mm -hmm. okay. The other thing that's impressive to me is how well you guys can speak to your robot <laughs> in front of us right. on TV. Mm -hmm. It's impressive. So part of that um, robotic program is that we have to answer questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and answer Love it. And we were awarded the judges award or their employees in front of the judge explaining their design, answering questions about problems in their notebook. Thank you guys. Congratulations. Thank Good luck. Thanks for coming. Guys, before you, before you leave, will each one of you tell us your names and then come up and shake our hands on your way back? All right. I'm Red and Meryl. Come on up here. <clears throat> come, right here, come right up front here, bud. <laughs> Can we read? Yeah. <laughs> Dylan Perkins. Oh, that did not sound good. Oh, Dylan. Way to go. Bridger Garvin. Bodie Kenny. Carson Miller. My name is Talon Sloan. Mason Miller. Congratulations. <laughs> Item 3.5, Navit presentation by Matt Weber. Come back and tell us how you did, okay? Yeah, come back to Oklahoma State. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Well, good evening, board members, uh, <coughs> Superintendent Housley. Appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, given our time and given that we have no new members here, at least that aren't familiar with NABIT, uh, I want to jump to if, if you could, Greg, just go ahead and jump to uh, slide nine with the numbers. Uh, just a, a brief reminder, you know, NAVIT, NAVIT exists for two reasons. One, to bring that funding stream here to Sholo Unified School District. And remember that that money is generated by the, your students that are in your career and technical education programs here at Sholo High School. And uh, so let's, let's just kind of briefly look at those numbers. Um, just remember, in, in the early days, we had freshman funding. So remember, the, the numbers at the, in, the, in the first decade there uh, are robust. We wish those were still the, our numbers, but given the freshmen taken out of that, that mix, uh, 
things went down after FY11, but if you notice over time, you've still been able to rebound. Uh, I'm excited to report uh, with FY20, you're still over 300,000 and you did break the 7 million mark this year with the money that's coming in. So I'm excited about that. And you, and you have plans coming up for this next year. I see continued growth. Uh, an enrollment in programs that are becoming, and I'll let your administration talk about those as they as they get closer to their final planning stages. But just know to break the seven million mark in the time that you've been with Navit is is Navit is awesome. Uh, that next slide there, uh, Greg, um, just a reminder. So that three hundred thousand is going towards your programs there. Uh, appreciate each one of your faculty members. Your your teachers make your programs and appreciate their willingness to focus on student achievement and to have them take the technical skills test. You may remember from a few years back, we almost lost our funding, but we promised them that every student would have an opportunity to take the technical skills assessment and some type of third party uh, national test or state recognized test, industry recognized uh, credentials. And everyone is participating in that. Um, even even digital photography, even though it's not required to have one Photoshop, your students, you know, have been taking that. And so all of the teachers uh, have embraced that and, and we appreciate the opportunities to work with them. Uh, just very briefly, the, the next slide there just shows the access to the programs that your students have if they want to leave campus for half a day and join us. But I always want to emphasize that 90% of the current tech ed that happens is right here in Shola High School. Not everyone can have the, t not everyone has the time to take half a day off, but the programs that are there, we're, we're excited to offer them for those who have that, that kind of time. And then uh, that uh, next slide, just a reminder, we do provide your teachers the opportunity to uh, access additional 301 funding that we receive. And so we do provide professional development for your teachers. Uh, we pay registration fees, hotels, they just have to, you know, submit to us the, the type of training that they want that helps lead to, to those certifications I mentioned. Uh, we've, we've had, we've sent teachers to national conventions in Los Angeles. We've, uh, we've, we've had your teachers out there. We appreciate them participating in that. We've also had a, uh, your teachers involved in curriculum development. So when state standards change, we pay them $20 an hour. We pay them directly. They can have up to 80 hours per year. And uh, your teachers are regular participants in that. And we also provide uh, stipends for those who want to, say, be an, uh, an advisor for Skills USA, you know, or for FCCLA. And so your teachers have the option of, of receiving that funding too. So uh, in addition to the money that comes directly, like the check that I just had Greg signed before the meeting started, you also have that money coming back to your schools via our 301 money. And so uh, of what you generate right in between 85 and 90 percent is, is coming right back to Sholo schools. So we're excited for the opportunities we have to help your students. And once again, appreciate your faculty, appreciate your administration. Uh, when you look at those consistent numbers in how much funding is coming to your district, that reflects administration and, and their support of current tech ed and your teachers that take the time to work with students and grow their own programs. And, and you've got some programs in the wings that are, that are growing that I'm excited about and can't wait to see as they, as they come on full time and into your high school. With that, I'll entertain any, any questions that the board has. I don't have any questions. I just thank you for what you do. Thanks, Pat. Appreciate that. I will. I do want to do a shout out for, for Ben today. We, I uh, have wanted to uh, start up, uh, for lack of better terms, an Apache principals meeting. And uh, we had our first one today. Uh, it's hard for principals to get together. And so I offered to just be the coordinator of that. We had our first meeting that they, it's been a few years since they've been able to meet. Ben was there today with things to share. And so I took 10 minutes and about an hour and a half with principals sharing information, asking questions, and appreciate Ben's time and, and participating in that. But just know we appreciate working with you and, and value our partnership. Thank, Thank you, you. Mr. Thank, you Thank you so much. Um, item 3.6, call the audience, Brandy, any more? Okay, item 3.7, Mr. Housley, superintendent report. Um, 
Madam President, I want to defer. I don't have anything uh, necessarily to put, report, but I'd like to have Mrs. Clark come up and share some things from the junior high, some data that um, I think is pertinent to my report. Thank you. Um, we, this is what happens when you say to Mr. Housley, can you just tell the board this one thing? And he says, why don't you present? Um, so I have some exciting things to share with you, um, specifically relating to um, the latest data dig that we did as a school. Um, every time we administer a quarterly benchmark, then uh, the teams of teachers get together and, and delve through that data and just kind of look at um, where our students are, um, what kind of gaps they have to mastery, and um, how far you know we need to go and what we need to do to support them. So the data that you're looking at um, on your screens and um, is showing it reflects our um, second quarter benchmark data historically over the last three years um, since our school district has partnership with beyond textbooks. The numbers that you see are the um, average percentage of student achievement. So per standard, these are the standards that were tested in second quarter for sixth grade reading. In um, 2017, the average score was 45.3. So in the yellow column, what we're looking at is the current data um, from 2019. And I think it's important to note that in almost, with regard to almost every standard in every grade level in both reading and math, we're seeing an increase. In some cases, it's incremental, um, but with regard to a couple of standards, we've seen some exponential um, rise in academic achievement and um, the teachers get all the credit. They are doing a phenomenal job to bring students to mastery and that reteach piece that we talked about for math is um, supporting our students. So specifically, I want to talk a little bit about a couple of those um, standards for sixth grade. Um, Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So I just wanted to make sure I understood. This is the average score. Right. This isn't mastery. This is just the average the average score. score. So okay. if you consider that mastery would be considered at our school, we consider seventy percent. Okay. The mastery piece. Okay. Um. So what you're seeing is an average score in relationship. To so that. the average score on the second one on the sixth grade at 73.5 would be considered like mastery. Some, yes. As a grade average level. score is mastery. Correct. Okay. Correct. And then can I ask a question too? So the group that took these tests on in 2017 were, con I'm looking at the sixth six grade. Sixth graders. So it's not a cohort group. It's how the sixth graders are performing each year. But, that, but then when I go look at the eighth grade benchmark, that is the sixth graders that took, they were the sixth graders in 2017. Correct. So that is a pretty significant improvement. I mean, if you're looking at sixth grade reading benchmark 2017, that's 45.3%, I guess. And then you look at the eighth grade reading benchmark now in 2019, that's 66.7. So that's an increase of almost 20, 24.3%. I mean, that's a huge, is that, the, that, so that's the same groups we're looking at. Is That's true. But what we're looking at is, um, the, even though, like in language arts, for example, the reading standards are very, very, very similar. Like there's very little variation between sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade with regard to the reading standard. So you can make that comparison. But what happens as you get from sixth grade to eighth grade is the rigor increases and the depth of knowledge to which students are required to demonstrate mastery increases. So in layman's terms, it's tougher. Like the tests are more rigorous. The reading passages that they have to analyze are more rigorous. And so I think that it, to your point, um, Grant, the overall scores, like maybe even that's more exponential because it does get more difficult for kids with regard to those standards. If you look specifically at um, that fourth one, explain how an author develops the point of view of the narrator or speaker in a text. This is not just identifying who the speaker is in the text, but you have to have some um, evidence in your response to support how the author is developing to that point. Um, word choice, things like that. That's the type of question a student would be asked with regard to that standard. So 
um, sixth graders performing in 2017 compared to sixth graders performing in 2018 compared to sixth graders performing in 2019, we're seeing a 20% increase in achievement. So um, what does that speak to? The kids that are in sixth grade this year have been part of that Beyond Textbooks partnership um, for a number of years. And so while we're celebrating tonight Chilo Junior High and an, an increase in achievement, I would say if we even look back at what the K-5 teachers are doing to prepare students, all the credit goes to them too, because the kids are coming to us more prepared and so we're able to move the needle in terms of mastery. Um, we're not there yet, as we, as we like to say, and I think that's good because it shows me where the kids need growth and um, it helps the teachers understand what, what their target looks like. Um, just kind of generally speaking, if we could go to the next slide, Mr. Schubert, um, the seventh graders, um, the one that kind of sticks out to me the most is the second from the bottom, analyze the interactions between individuals, events, and ideas in a text. This is where kids have to take a text and identify, you know, how, do the, how does the setting drive the character's response in a plot, something like that. So it, it's increasingly more rigorous, as I said, and our kids um, are reaching mastery. What we would consider mastery at our school is 70% at this time. At some point, we'll bump that up, right, as our kids, the gaps in their skill set and knowledge base closes. Um, but for now, um, we're super excited to see um, that increase in achievement. And what's exciting, too, if we can look at the eighth grade um, reading data, the second standard, determine a theme or central idea of a tech and analyze its development over the course of the tech. This is kind of difficult for kids. They can identify theme and they can identify plot, but to determine how those things interact and how the author uses word choice and characters and setting to drive that um, is, is cognitively difficult. Um, and so you can see that in 2017, sixth graders average score was, I'm sorry, eighth graders average score was 58.3%. Um, and we're seeing 85.3% for an average score this year. So those kind of more <coughs> difficult tasks that we're asking kids to do in reading, they're meeting the challenge. And like I said, there's a handful of places as you go through this data on your own. Um, I've tried to italicize the ones where we were either kind of where we have been all along, a little bit stagnant or even below. Um, the teachers then look at things like, what were the questions asking? Um, what um, teaching methods did they use? Um, how did the kids respond in a classroom assessment? Something like that. So it gives us a better idea of how to adjust our instruction to get kids to achieve in terms of academics. You also have included um, in the PDF the math um, benchmarks. Same model, but we're looking at math this time. And very specifically, um, with sixth grade, a couple of um, celebration points are the second and third standard there where we are, we're seeing um, quite a high increase. The sixth grade teachers um, adjusted some of the way that they were teaching um, absolute value with regard to rational numbers, which I'm not a math teacher. That would be Mr. Merchant or Mrs. Tregaskis could speak to that. But um, they did um, last year talk a little bit about how they wanted to adjust their instruction. And we saw the gains in terms of achievement because our students now um, as far as our threshold is concerned, are achieving mastery with regard to that standard. And also um, solving equations with an inequality has increased um, in terms of students achieving that standard as well. So um, what we look at in the jump between sixth grade math and seventh and eighth grade math is the number of steps involved in solving a problem. And so, like I said, in a couple of places, we still have some work to do. But um, if you look, if we're looking at the seventh grade data, that standard second from the bottom, know the formulas for area and circumference of a circle. Really, that standard has to do with all things circle. And um, the teachers were actually kind of squealing with delight when they saw their data because our students have jumped up so much, um, even from last year in terms of that, and they were super excited like they got it. You know, the, the light bulb went on for kids. So um, the eighth grade 
math also, we're seeing some um, increases in terms of um, what kids are able to retain. Um, if you look at the eighth grade math data, that um, fourth standard down uh, regarding scatter plots that has students achieving at 80.9% um, as an average score, that was taught last in the quarter. And so there was some discussion about what does that mean? So, you know, part of this um, presentation of data specifically tonight was to kind of help you see how far we've um, come in terms of our curriculum and how um, successful our current system is when um, we look at student achievement data. But also, I think it's valuable for you to know um, in terms of this calendar conversation, when we say we want to get teachers together and have discussions about data, what I've kind of blazed through tonight, really for essence of time, is very surface. Our teachers spend um, like a whole day really kind of digging through this and determining where the students still have gaps as a whole grade level, as individual class groups, and then as individual students. And so they're able to break this data down and really um, figure out what the students' needs are and how they want to address that through fine-tuning their instruction or some individual reteachers. So do you have any questions about I want to move on to the next one. I know you guys have been sitting a long time. But... OK. The next slide has to do with um, the civics test. In Arizona, as you all know, the civics test is required for a student to be eligible for a graduation diploma from high school. Um, here in Sholo, we begin administering that civics test in eighth grade. Um, our social studies team and Mrs. Alsobrook, our academic advisor, have partnered with um, the high school counseling department to create a system whereby we assess our students and then we're able to share their scores with the high school. Um, what we say to kids is it's kind of low key, low pressure, but we want you to have something ticked off your list before you go to high school and get a jump start on graduation. So that's kind of fun. Our social studies teachers are very diligent in terms of their um, maintaining the standards and um, the efficacy of those standards in their instruction. And so um, I'm proud to report that um, we administered that exam um, just after we came back from winter break and 90% of our eighth graders passed the civics test and have that checked off for high school graduation. So that's exciting. That 10% that didn't quite make the mark represents 22 students. Um, of that 22 students, um, most of them will be given another opportunity to take the assessment. Some students have special needs, and so um, maybe their individualized education plan only requires they make an attempt. But um, we will be administering the exam again after some reteach and review with kids because we'd really like to move as many as possible to the high school with that picked off. So that's exciting. I want to report tonight on some character education pieces that we're pushing out um, at the junior high school this year, kind of in a different way. Um, I talked a little bit before about our reteach period for math, but kids that don't need reteach for math are participating in character education. And they're doing that um, 25 minutes a day in two ways. The first thing they look at um, when they come in, kind of as a bell work activity, is a prompt um, and they write in what we call gratitude journals. The idea from for the gratitude journals came from Dr. Borba's book on selfie that we um, have been studying as a district over the last year or so. And um, this idea was kind of solidified for me in a training that I went to this summer. Um, it was an innovative leaders conference. Um, and there, there was some data presented about how mindfulness training and having students reflect on gratitude actually remaps the brain and um, helps them focus on more positive things. And that's one of our kind of goals as a junior high is to be kind and be positive and be understanding. So the gratitude prompts um, are something that I generate. I have some resources that um, I've been kind of going through to pull those. And we try to have them be appropriate to what the kids are going through as much as possible. So, for example, I gave you a couple of prompts that we have. Um, the first day back after winter break, 
The gratitude journal prompt was, what do you want to focus on this quarter and what goals do you have for yourself? So having kids kind of identify with goals and what they want to do was something we wanted to focus on. The teachers report that um, the way they're using this is the kids come in, they sit down, they get their journals, they write. Um, the sixth grade teachers are reporting that kids are writing more. When we started at the beginning of the school year, they were writing, you know, a couple of lines. And now there are teachers that say, like, we want to move on into our character, character education lesson and kids are still writing. That's kind of exciting because it's a way to bring writing in to free write. It's not graded. It's their ideas. And so they can really talk about things that, that are meaningful to them. Um, no one really reads the journals. Um, the te some teachers have said, you know, if you want me to read yours, let me know. Some teachers are using the prompt to guide discussions in their classroom. And it's just exciting to see how teachers are using that um, and their autonomy. And then for the other piece of character education, Second Step is a program that's being used K-5. And we were fortunate this year, Mrs. Ramsey was able to find some federal funding to help support bringing Second Step in to the junior high school in the 6-8 grade band. Um, it's not scripted, but it's a lesson plan that the teachers can follow and adapt for themselves. So the um, screen capture you have in your slide is one of the activities kids might do. It says, what are some small steps you can take to achieve your goal in your groups, help each other break your SMART goals down into small steps. So again, it helps us bring kids to things that will help them grow, help them personally, and just um, be well-rounded. So we're excited about that. The most exciting thing, I mean, these are all great, but I am proud to report to you tonight that the Shola Junior High School Library is open for the first time since 2013 and legitimately open. We uh, had a lot of people put in a lot of work from staff members to our PTSO took shifts coming in. Um, after the construction in the slide, what you're seeing is the old stairs that went up to the loft. Um, those were taken out, and it was quite a sight <clears throat> to behold when the new carpet went in and all the drywall work was done. But every book had to be taken off the shelf and cleaned. The shelves all had to be cleaned, and everything had to be put back and inventoried. So that took a lot longer than we thought it was going to take. Um, we don't have a full-time staff member to tend our library, and so we've modified our system a little bit where um, we have a generic login for all teachers, and we've empowered them to go in and check books out with kids. The feedback that my leadership team shared with me last night was the kids are reading. Um, some of them are reading multiple books at the same time. Um, there's an excitement that about the library that I really hadn't anticipated from middle school kids, but um, when I went into the office on Monday for something, I noticed that one of the office aides had a book from the library and was just sitting there reading. So it's exciting, and we're kind of excited about the prospects for our library and what that might mean. We want to update it and do some fun things with furniture, but baby steps right now, we're just open, and we're grateful. Thank you. Mrs. Thank Clark. You. Thank you. Oh. you have anything to add? <clears throat> no? Three point eight. Any future agenda items? I don't have any. I don't have any. No. Okay. Item four point one: approval of overnight and out-of-state travel. Madam President, for and members of the board, for your consideration, Mr. Markchin recommends the approval of Diane Abel and uh, uh, Kimbrian Rova to take the early childhood program, advanced students to issue. College of Education, Vision School for the Blind, and the Arizona Center uh, Science Center in May 11th and 12th. And also, Ms. Ramsey recommends the approval of staff to attend the Dyslexia Southwest uh, 2020 Annual SWINDA Conference in Albuquerque, New Mexico, February 21st and 22nd. I ask for your approval of these out of state and over travel. I'll move we approve the overnight and out of state travel as listed. I'll second. Mm -hmm. Motion a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Item 5.1, approval of non-renewals, resignations, and retirement. For your consideration this evening is non-renewal. Uh, Mr. John Ryder, Junior High Social Studies, 
um, effective at the end of the year, resignations, Ashley Connor, Matt Ford, uh, Raquel Hollander, Amberlyn Power, Matt Thacker, and Jessica Zimmerman, all for your consideration this evening. A motion we approve. Motion and second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Item 5.2, approval of new hires and transfers. For your consideration this evening, um, new hires, uh, Cherry Cheeks, uh, Norma Cox, Christine Dunlap, uh, Rebecca Field, Steve Harrington, um, Mary Angela Klein, uh, Gail, um, uh, excuse me, was her turn? Um, Donna Marie Swaby. Um, and then transfers Fern Kaufman from a route driver to a sub driver. Lori Douglas to uh, account payable clerk to senior accounts payable clerk. And Roseanne Tows, um special ed bus aid um, to an eight hour sub bus bus aid. Uh, bring these for your consideration this evening. Make a motion to approve new hires and transfers. I'll second it, but I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, so we approved Lori to be. Um, her resignation. Are we just rehiring her? Is that like what is the technical? We we approved her retirement, and oh, she's retirement. Okay. Uh, she's um, in conversations with her. She's going to delay that retirement, mm -hmm. and so she. We don't have back, to do anything for that. Coming back into that that position, um, and uh, we had approved an assistant to that position before to kind of have the training specifically. Mm -hmm. She was going to train in that. That uh, training portion we're bringing with the change in title there too. So. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All in, fa all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Item 5.3 approval of substitute. For your consideration this evening, certified subs um, Bonnie Denham, Patricia Fitzgerald, uh, Gerald Hunsicker, uh, Gavin Mc McNeely, um, this classified Kelly Donahue, and Jessica. Russell, excuse me, my mouth is really <clears throat> dry. Uh, Riesel, for your consideration this evening. I'll move we approve the substitutes as listed. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Item 5.4, approval of stipends, volunteers, and event workers. Uh, for your consideration this evening, the following stipends. Uh, junior High Spring Cheer, Brittany McMillan. Um, junior High Track, Susan Cash. Uh, volunteers, High School Robotics, Dylan Cosgray. Um, high School Track, um, Matthew Allen, and High School WMI Talent, Tammy Clark, um, as an event worker, Joseph Padilla. I bring these to you for your consideration. How much should we approve? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Item 7.1, bond update. Um, Madam President, members of the board, for your, uh, just some information to bring before you this evening. Um, we are in the process of collecting those those bids as we talked about we we got the evaluation from uh, the auditorium it was over a hundred thousand so we have to get uh, sealed bids for that so we'll be out looking for those um, we also are looking at some other things uh, right now one of the priorities um, that is kind of taking place in front of everything else is uh, making sure that all of our um, our systems are up so that we can fully conduct uh, announcements in, in particular uh, lockdowns and other things like that. So having the um, speakers and um, the things that are out now, we had a system put in place that will allow us to project that. Now we've got to find the the areas where the speakers need to replace or their wiring or others. We need to add strobes or things like that to enhance the system. So we, we've been uh, looking at that right now to make sure that those things all functioning. Um, that's another thing that just came up uh, that we want to make sure that we're resolving um, as a result of our lockdowns that we've conducted, our lockdown practices that we did last week. So, any questions? Item 7.2 discussion and approval of the agreement between Sholo Unified School District and Navajo County Special Services. Madam President, before we start, I'm going to declare conflict on this. My uh, the County Attorney's Office represents the Superintendent's Schools Office, and so I'm not going to take any action. Okay. You guys want me to yeah. leave? <clears throat> okay, if I stay here. What do you guys? Yeah. What's the protocol? I think you're good. 
you like to take me? Let me take, <clears throat> would you like me to take this one? Yes, please. Um, every year we do a special services um, agreement with the county. This is just the re the reauthorization of those. Within the uh, within your packet, you will see what the charges are going to be for that for the upcoming school year. So we bring it to you right now for your approvals. <clears throat> Does any of this have to be adjusted with our calendar? Uh, as far as service days, we'll have to look into if there's some adjustments. We don't need as to worry about that right now. As a result of tonight's night, we'll modify. I move we approve the agreement <coughs> between Sholo Unified School District and Navajo County Special Service Consortium. As listed. All second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Number eight, consent agenda. Mr. Schubert. So tonight we bring you for your approval the ratification of our payroll and our expense vouchers, the ratification of the junior high, high school, and the food services account revenues and expenditures, approval of the governing board minutes from the January 21st, uh, 2020 regular meeting, and the following donations. Target field trips awarded $700 to Nicholas Homestead's third grade for their spring field trip. We bring this to you tonight for your approval. I'll move we approve the consent agenda. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Motion to adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. I'll second. Thank you.